So we've looked in detail at the data structure of a transaction. Uh, we've also looked in detail at the data structure of a block. Now what we're going to do is we're going to consider the network. So how is it that these transactions move around the network? How is it that they end up in blocks? Who are the participants on the network? Uh, these are the kinds of questions that we're considering here. Uh, we won't consider how do you know that the block is right? How do the other nodes validate it? How do they agree? Uh, that this is the block that will be added to the blockchain as opposed to some other block. Uh, that we'll deal with in the next uh, little section on consensus. Okay, so what we have is uh, we have uh, what we, uh, what's called a peer-to-peer -peer network. So a peer-to-peer -peer network is uh, there's a set of nodes and these nodes can be anywhere in the world and in practice in Bitcoin's case uh, they tend to be uh, distributed all around the world, you know, globally. Um, so you'll, you'll find nodes in, in lots of different countries and they'll be connected somehow uh, to each other. And uh, the basic job of these nodes is they're gonna relay uh, transactions around the network, okay? So when they hear about transactions, they're gonna uh, relay them uh, to the people that they're connected to. Um, and some of them may also mine, but it's not strictly necessary. So some of these might be miners, some of them might not be miners. Okay, so uh, these things we call a full node. And that's one way that you can run a node. There's a, there's a couple others. We'll, we'll circle back and uh, think about all the different ways, uh, that the, the different configurations or the different levels of participation that you might have when we talk about user experience, because it's up to the users to decide how much they want to um, participate. But, a full node will at least uh, relay uh, messages. Okay, and then some of these will also be miners, and I, I won't do them in a different color, but we'll assume, assume that there's miners as well. And so the a miner is basically a full node plus mining, meaning they try and do the proof of work. Okay, so, so this is uh, the network itself. Uh, it's, as I mentioned, a peer-to-peer -peer network. And the idea that you just um, kind of talk to your peers and when you hear about things, you tell your peers about what you've heard of is, is uh, called a gossip network or gossip protocol. Uh, and it's just a very casual way of doing it. There's not any orchestration. Uh, it might not be the most efficient uh, under different kind of adverse situations. Um, but it, but anyways, it's it's just the simplest to deploy and it's the simplest to think about. Um, and so, so yeah, so if you hear about a transaction, you're gonna relay it to, to everyone that you're connected to, okay? Um, now we're gonna have the user here and we're not focused really on how it how they come to, to create a transaction or you know what their software looks like or anything like that. Uh, we'll talk about that, uh, so that's coming when we talk about user experience. Um, but we're going to assume that they're, you know, they're they're connected to the network, and uh, they're basically running what what's called a full node. Uh, so th so they're a node in the network, just like every other node in the network. Okay, not any different. Uh, they're connected to a couple of their peers, and obviously their peers are connected to everyone else. And so if they tell their peers about a transaction, then it will somehow relay around the network. Okay, so the user is going to have a transaction. So here's the user. Uh, and they have a transaction. And we spent a lot of time on the nitty gritty details of the transaction when we talked about uh, the data structure of the transaction. And so I'm not going to draw it in the same level of detail. Let's just sort of abstract away all the detail and just concentrate on a few key elements of a transaction. So uh, transactions have an ID, so we'll call this transaction TXID for a transaction ID. Uh, transactions have a set of inputs and they have a set of outputs, okay? Uh, so the input will be some previous transaction, okay? Uh, previous transaction output, we'll call it TXO. And really what a TXO is is um, is it's going to be the identity of a previous transaction. Uh, so TXID prime we'll call the previous transaction. Um, 
you know, who knows, you know, maybe it was 50 blocks ago, maybe it was 100 blocks ago, we're not sure. Um, but anyway, we're going to specify it. And every transaction has a set of outputs. Uh, there's more than one output. And so you have to also say, which output is it in this transaction? So maybe it was the second output of this previous transaction. That's what you're trying to spend, okay? And there's some amount associated with it. So let's say it's two Bitcoin. Okay, so one input is, is two Bitcoin that comes from this position uh, in the blockchain. And there's maybe another two Bitcoin that you have somewhere else. Uh, so this is another TXO. And, you know, this is in some other identity called double prime. And maybe it's the first output in that particular transaction. Okay. Now, uh, a transaction is also going to have a set of outputs. And so uh, the first output will be, um, so this output is the output of this transaction. Okay, this is the output that belongs to this transaction. So it's gonna have the same identity as the transaction itself. It's for this transaction. And uh, this will be the first output and this will be the second output. Okay, now this is what, like, I wanna emphasize that we are abstracting away uh, the details. Um, so uh, Bitcoin transactions don't work exactly like this, but, but it's just to try and give you the intuition. Okay, uh, so the outputs, um, first off, the number of outputs is totally up to you. Uh, so in this case, we're going to assume that the user, uh, maybe they want to send three Bitcoin to someone. Um, okay, and so uh, two Bitcoin, uh, they have two Bitcoin sitting in a previous transaction. They have another two Bitcoin sitting in another previous transaction. So they put the two together, that makes four. Uh, they send three to the person that they want to. Uh, then, and then there's one left over. We'll assume that maybe they give a, a, a fee or a tip uh, to the miner. Uh, so they'll, they'll give a little less to one Bitcoin and they'll send it back to themselves. So this is their, their what we call change address, okay? Um, all right, now this previous transaction has, uh, this transaction, uh, I should maybe specify it here, uh, but we need an address, right? So this transaction output, this is the location of it. This is the amount. Uh, and then we're also going to have an address uh, that it goes to. Okay, and these previous ones also have addresses uh, associated with them. Uh, you can go back, find, look up that transaction in the previous uh, block, wherever it happens to be, and then you can check and see what the address is. And uh, this transaction is going to have to be signed by whatever address is affiliated with this, and whatever address is affiliated with this, assuming it's not the same address as this particular thing, okay? Um, so there's going to be some signatures on this transaction. Okay, uh, the signatures we'll pick up a little later as well. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about them in a little more detail and, and how, um, how is it that your wallet decides which outputs to put into a transaction, things like that. We'll, we'll put under the kind of user experience uh, part of the, of the lecture. And this idea of signing and what exactly gets signed. Um, later, we'll, we'll have a little section on kind of miscellaneous issues in Bitcoin. And so uh, one issue is something called transaction malleability. And in transaction malleability, we uh, care a lot about how the signature works. And so we're, we're going to give, I'll give you a lot more detail of, of how that works later. But for now, you can just think of it as kind of signing all of the stuff that's above it. Uh, it kind of locks in those values so they can't be changed. Okay, so this is our transaction, so that's fine. Uh, when we're, we're done with our transaction, we're ready to broadcast it. Um, so we start with our kind of transaction here. And we're going to broadcast it to the nodes that we know about. Uh, how is it that we learn what these nodes are? Well, your software is going to come with some sort of pre-baked nodes. Uh, I guess we're going to this node twice. Uh, it's going to come with some pre-baked nodes uh, in it, and then once you're able to connect to a few nodes, you can ask those nodes, hey, what, what are the other nodes that you know about? Uh, and then you can kind of build up your list of nodes, okay? And then these nodes will, will further relay it 
around the network. Uh, and so hopefully it's the case that um, all the other nodes somehow learn about this transaction. Maybe they learn about it you know, from multiple different nodes along different paths. Okay, so it sort of spreads uh, through the network. Uh, and so all the, the nodes uh, have heard about it. Okay, now what's a node going to do when it sees a new transaction? Okay, so it sees this new transaction and it wants to make sure that, that certain things are true about this transaction. Um, so some of them are, are really basic that you can see um, just by looking at the transaction itself. For example, uh, the outputs add up to an amount that's bigger than the outputs. Uh, the signatures are correct. There is a signature for every single output, uh, those kinds of things, okay? And then there's a second thing that you wanna check that's actually a lot harder to check. And that is, um, we're pointing to this previous transaction output where this address received Bitcoin. But how do we know that this is the first transaction to spend that? Okay, how do we know that, that there isn't some other transaction? Maybe yesterday there was a transaction that already spent that particular transaction, okay? So what we have to do is, <coughs> excuse me, what we have to do is we have to verify uh, the status of this transaction output. And we wanna verify basically, has it been spent or not spent, okay? So how do nodes do this? Um, the way that they're gonna do it is as follows. Oh, so I'm gonna pull this down onto a second page. Okay, so this is our, our full node. <coughs> and full nodes um, are going to basically keep two data structures Uh, that they're going to play around with in memory if you if you want to think of it that way. Okay, so they're going to maintain two kind of data structures. Um, okay, so the first thing is they're going to maintain the blockchain. Okay, so they're going to have a copy of the entire blockchain. Um, so say the complete blockchain. And in order to make Right, if, if I wanna know whether this has been spent or not, what I have to do is I have to look at every single transaction in Bitcoin ever, right? I have to start kind of at the start of, of time and, and go all the way through, or at least I should check all the transactions, I guess, since this transaction was created. So it, it couldn't be spent before it was, was, was an output. So, but in any case, what I'm doing is I'm doing a, a complete comb uh, through the entire blockchain, at least from when that transaction was introduced. Okay, um, so that's fine. And if I have to do that for every output, so if I look at this output and then I have to comb through the blockchain to see has it been spent, yes or no, then I go to this one and then I comb through the blockchain again, right? Every single one of these transaction outputs, you know, I'm doing kind of a amount of work that's linear in, in the size of the, Bitcoin, of the blockchain itself. Uh, so that's a lot of work, that's too much work. We don't wanna do that. Um, we don't want to be you know, going from start to finish through the blockchain every single time we see one of these little things. Uh, so what nodes will do is they'll say, you know, it, it would be a lot nicer if we had kind of a cleaner data structure, a data structure that allows us quickly to verify what's spent and what's unspent, okay? Um, so what they do instead is they walk through the blockchain once and uh, for every transaction output, Um, what they do is they, they split, they basically mark it. They say, okay, um, these transaction outputs, uh, the first time they see it, so think of this as, as, as moving through in time. So the first time you see a transaction output, initially it's unspent. Okay, so we have a set of unspent transaction outputs. Okay, so we have all these transaction outputs and we, we kind of put them on this one side. And then every now and then uh, we'll see a transaction that spends something that's in here, okay? So we'll have another uh, data structure which we'll think of as spent TXOs. Uh, and uh, every now and then what we're going to do is we're going to, you know, th there'll be some TXO that was here. Uh, we see a transaction that spends it. So we move it over here and we remove it. Um, so we remove it from this data structure here, okay?
Okay. And um, so anyways, this is, um, uh, this has a, a, a name which is uh, already kind of specified. So these are, it's the set of unspent transaction outputs or it's, uh, so in Bitcoin, they like using the term pool. Um, so they call this uh, the UTXO, unspent transaction output pool. Okay. And so if I want to know, is this transaction spent or not? All I do is I, I take it and I go into my UTXO pool and I see if it's there or not. Okay. Uh, if it's not there, then it should be on this side. If, if I actually did went through the complete blockchain, I didn't miss anything. It's either here or it's here. Okay. Uh, if it's not here, then by definition, it has to be here. Um, and so what, what uh, miners will do is they won't actually even maintain this, okay? Uh, instead of having a set of sent transaction outputs, they'll just assume that if it's not here, then it is spent at all, okay? And so you don't ever have to really reference this. You just, you're only referencing the unspent transactions uh, to see if they're there or not. Um, so this stuff, uh, they basically just throw away. Okay, and the nice thing about that is the blockchain has every transaction. And if you think about this intuitively, once once some Bitcoin is spent, um, you don't there's there's nothing to do with that transaction anymore. Like that transaction will never come up again, unless if somebody's trying to spend it twice, right? If they're trying to spend it twice, but that's malicious, right? And so there's no legitimate reason that you would ever refer to some transaction. Uh, output that's already been spent. Okay, so you can basically just discard it. Uh, and then the nice thing about that is it also cuts down the memory. So the blockchain is pretty big. Uh, instead of keeping um, every transaction in the blockchain, we can throw away all the, the spent transactions and just keep the ones that are unspent. Okay, so this is like a subset, a small subset of the blockchain, and, and that's good for memory. The other thing too is that there's no there's no discretion in terms of what this UTXO pool looks like, right? Once you've you know if if ten nodes or hundred nodes go through the complete blockchain and they make this list, it should look the same. Um, so every node will have the should have the exact same UTXO pool. Okay, and uh, you could actually, it's, it's actually a very good idea to uh, say what that UTXO pool looks like. Like, for example, you could hash it down uh, to a kind of a commitment and uh, actually put it in the blockchain. And so this is something that Bitcoin doesn't do. Uh, it, it, different people have raised it in the past as, as an idea for, uh, for adding kind of more security to, to Bitcoin. But anyways, that, that's a kind of consensus issue. And so let's, let's not talk about that uh, at this point. Okay, so the, the first data structure, I, I said two data structures, it looks like maybe these are the two, but uh, since this one's getting thrown away, this is the one data structure. So this is one of the, the data structures, um, which is that we take the complete blockchain and then we uh, filter out all the spent transactions and we only keep the unspent transactions. So the UTXO pool is, is the first. Okay, and so what the node will do is they'll look at this transaction and they'll say, uh, these transaction outputs, I, I see them in my UTXO pool. Okay, therefore they're not spent. Okay, therefore I'm, I'm ready uh, to spend them. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, so once it has the UTXO pool, uh, then what it will do is it will take the transaction It will check that each uh, transaction output uh, in the inputs. So it's kind of weird that the inputs are a set of outputs, uh, but anyways, you have to get comfortable with that terminology. Uh, so you're going to check that each uh, transaction output in the inputs uh, is unspent. 
uh, IE, that is, it's exactly equivalent to um, uh, they are in the UTXO pool. Okay. Then once it's done this check, uh, what it will do is, um, so I, I sort of pitch this as uh, when you see a transaction, you relay it and then you do the validation. Usually the nodes will, will validate first and they will only relay it if it, if it passes these basic checks. But um, what, what they're ready to do now is they're, they're ready to say, okay, this is a valid transaction. It should be added to Bitcoin's blockchain. Okay, but we don't know which node is going to get lucky, solve the proof of work and actually extend that block. Uh, so what pools, or sorry, what, what nodes will do is they'll keep a collection of pending transactions, okay? So they'll take this um, new transaction, okay? It's a transaction that's been validated, okay? And what they're going to do is they're going to take this transaction and they're going to put it in a set of uh, pending transactions, so transactions that are valid, but haven't been added to a block. No one's added them to a block yet. And okay, so this is called the mempool, memory pool. And so that's the other data structure uh, that, that nodes are going to maintain. Okay, so they have a set of all the unspent, transa unspent transaction outputs, and they have a set of pending transactions, transactions that they've seen. Okay, now the mempool, um, it is possible, for example, if you have a transaction um, that maybe there's some node that for some reason doesn't get reached. Uh, they don't learn about a particular transaction. Maybe they're sort of segmented from the network or, or I don't know, there's a variety of reasons. Um, another thing too is that if a node is mining, uh, so for example, this node is mining, they can just put their transactions directly into the blocks that they're trying to solve without relaying them around the network. Uh, so sometimes you don't know that a transaction exists until it's actually put, it's a part of a block uh, that's being proposed by a miner. Um, but in any event, uh, the set of transactions, the sort of pending transactions that any one of these nodes sees should be largely the same. So, you know, they, they should have basically the same set of transactions, but there might be slight differences between them. Uh, there might be a few transactions that, that some have seen and others haven't seen or, or that type of thing. Okay. Um, so the mempool is not, unlike the UTXO pool, it's not a uniform data structure where uh, every, every node on the network has exactly the same copy. Okay. So there, there can be variations. notes okay so the mining process kind of falls under consensus so I don't, I don't want to spend a lot of time but I, I do want to kind of complete uh, this data structure um, so what will happen is for the miners what they're going to do is they're going to take transactions from their mempool These are TXOs. They're actually UTXOs in the sense that they've been validated to have been unspent. And what they're going to do is they're going to make a little block, a proposal. Okay. So they're going to put a bunch of transactions into this block trans and put them in the Merkle tree. Okay. So they're going to select them. They might not be able to fit all of them. Okay, so, or maybe they have some reason, like maybe this is a transaction that's perfectly valid, but it's not tipping them, it's not paying them any money, and they have some policy that they're, they're going to ignore it because the fee's too low. Maybe the block is full, so they have more, uh, more uh, transactions in their mempool than they can fit in a single block. Uh, so there, there's a variety of reasons why uh, it might not be a one-to-one -one mapping of the mempool to the block. 
Um, but anyways, um, so they're, they're going to take some set of these transactions, they're going to put it in the block. In addition, uh, what they're going to do is actually write the very first transaction that they'll put in the block uh, will be what we saw before, which is this Coinbase transaction. So this is a special transaction where the miner adds up all the fees in the transactions that they're included and they pay themselves those fees. And uh, they also pay themselves the block reward. Uh, so this will have the fees plus the block reward. And what's special about this transaction um, is that uh, there's no inputs. Okay, so the fees are coming from the fact that there's differences between the outputs and the inputs of all of these transactions. And so they're not considered inputs to this particular transaction. That You could structure it that way, but anyways, Bitcoin doesn't structure it that way. And then the block reward is newly minted Bitcoin. It just comes out of thin air. It didn't exist in the block before, and now it exists. And so it's given to you by the protocol. It's not given to you by somebody else. Uh, so the Coinbase has no inputs. So it's, it's a weird transaction uh, in the sense that the input field will be blank. Uh, and that's also how you know it's the Coinbase transaction is because of, of that uh, convention. Okay. Then the other thing the miner can do if they want is they might have a private pool of transactions. So I'll call this a private mempool where they have um, a couple transactions that they want processed, but for some reason they don't want to broadcast it to the network. Okay. Um, so what they'll do is they'll put this into the format of a block. Um, so they'll have the Merkle root, uh, they'll link it to the previous block uh, in the blockchain, and then they'll start their knots at zero and they'll, they'll keep hashing and hashing and hashing and hoping that they, they come out uh, with the proper, with the block that wins. Uh, once, once that happens, if it happens for them, then they'll broadcast it uh, back to the network. Okay, and then the network will, um, the network has to validate all of these transactions. So the network will look at these transactions and in particular, if there's private transactions here, uh, the rest of the network hasn't seen them yet. Uh, so they're gonna have to ask the miner or usually what will happen is the miner when they broadcast their solution, they'll also broadcast these as well. Because if no one can get a copy of them, then they can't validate them, then they're just gonna ignore this block. Um, so it's not in the miner's best interest to uh, withhold these transactions. They do have to circulate them. Um, anyways, we're, we're now starting to, t to touch more on issues of consensus, uh, which, which I explicitly want to leave uh, to the next lecture. Um, so um, let's, let's go back through the, the sort of protocol and, and just as a recap. So user joins the network as a node. They're connected to a bunch of other networks. Uh, they make their transaction. They broadcast it to whoever they know. Uh, these nodes relay it around the network. Every single node, um, before they've even seen this transaction, like when they first come online, uh, what they've done is they've obtained a full copy of the blockchain and they parse through it from start to finish. Uh, they threw away all the transactions that were spent, all the transaction outputs that were spent. They keep a list of the unspent transaction outputs in something, a data structure called the UTXO pool. And so when this transaction comes, what they do is they make sure that all the inputs to this transaction are elements in the UTXO pool. Okay. Um, then once they, uh, once they do that, um, they broadcast it around the network. Uh, the nodes will take this transaction, they'll put it in their mempool, which is their list of pending transactions. Uh, the nodes that happen to be mining as well, uh, what they'll do is maybe uh, if, if there's enough fees and there's enough room in the blocks and, and the, a bunch of other constraints are meant, uh, then they'll take that transaction and they'll put it into their block. And then eventually one of them will solve a block. Okay. And so um, let's assume that, that in this case, that this is a winning block. Okay. Then the final thing is, uh, so what the miner will do is uh, the, the broadcast the block
So it broadcasts any transactions that they think uh, people won't have a copy of, you know, private transactions that are, that are in the block. Okay, other nodes are going to validate the block. Okay, so what does this look like? Uh, what, what they're going to do is for each transaction, uh, that's inside the block, um, they're going to say, okay, do I have this in my mempool? And if the answer is yes, then uh, they've already validated, like they were trying to put that transaction in a block of themselves. Okay, so they've already done all the validation. And in this case, uh, they would consider it a valid transaction. Okay, if it's not in their mempool, um, what they have to do is they have to get a copy of it. So they have to obtain it. Okay. And then they're going to have to check each UTXO or sorry, each TXO uh, from the inputs. Uh, and what do we mean by check? Uh, so for each UTXO uh, okay, so so the uh, each UTX TXO from the inputs, uh, they're going to say, you know, is it in my UTXO pool? And if the answer is yes, uh, then it's valid. And if the answer is no, it's it's invalid. Okay, so uh, if we get down here, this is invalid. Okay. And if even one transaction, if one input of one transaction is not valid, then, then they throw the whole block away. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about what incentivizes them to do that uh, when we talk about consensus. Uh, if they reach this point, it's valid. And if they reach this point, it's valid as well. Okay, so this is kind of a decision tree uh, that they sort of go through. Um, and of course, there's more to checking, um, more to checking, uh, like, when they put stuff in the UTXO pool, you have to check signatures and things like that. So, so, so there are other checks as well. Um, so I'll, let me just note this here. I'll put and other checks. Okay. Okay, so that, that's basically what happens. Okay, so now we've broadcast the block. Um, we broadcast all the private transactions that are in the block. Uh, all the other nodes have validated the block and we'll assume that, um, that now uh, we'll switch to the other nodes. And we'll assume that, the, that at this point the, the block is actually valid. So they want to accept it. Now what do the other nodes have to do? Well, what the other nodes have to do is they now have another block. And so what they have to do is they have to do this process again for this new block. So they have to go through all the transaction outputs uh, that are in this new block, which were unspent before they heard about the block. But now because this block is the newest block, uh, these things are actually spent. Okay, so they have to go and they're going to remove all of the UTXOs that are in transactions in the block uh, from, their, from their UTXO pool. Okay, so they're going to remove all um, UTXOs uh, corresponding to uh, transaction inputs in, in the block. Okay, uh, so they're going to remove these from their pool. So a block will have thousands of transactions. Each of these transactions might have two, three, four, five, you know, any number of, of inputs. And so for all of these, they have to remove them uh, from their pool, okay? And then the other thing that happens with all these transactions, um, so to be concrete, that means this is a transaction that would have been in their UTXO pool 
this would have been in their UTXO pool. So now those are gone. Okay. Um, so they're going to remove all these uh, for, from the UTXO pool. And then in addition, there's a bunch of new transaction outputs that are created, right? So these guys get spent. And now these guys are uh, new transaction outputs that probably aren't spent yet. Uh, it is possible that maybe there's another transaction in the same block that then goes ahead and spends them. Um, but it, anyways, at least as, as when you process this, uh, what you'll do is you'll initially, um, you're going to populate, sorry, uh, look at the wrong data structure. You're going to populate your UTXO with new unspent transaction outputs. So all TXOs corresponding to transaction outputs. to the UTXO pool. Okay, uh, so you'll add all of them, all the outputs. And this includes the, so, so the two kind of nuances here. Um, so I'll say nuance, nuances. Okay, so the first nuance is that um, you can have transactions that that uh, that are sort of chained together, where you have a transaction and uh, you have another transaction that spends outputs from that transaction. Uh, so so Bitcoin flows from one account in one transaction, and then there's a second transaction where that same Bitcoin moves to a new account and then to a new account. So they're kind of like these chains and transactions. These chain transactions can be all put in a single block. That's fine, but if any of the links in the chain are missing other than the ones at the end, uh, then you can't put those transactions in the, in the block, okay? So in other words, when you're looking at your mempool and you have all of these transactions, um, it might be the case that, that the output of this is an input uh, to this particular transaction, okay? So this is a perfectly valid transaction, um, right? So this one's valid, and this is also a valid transaction and maybe this output, you know, is the input to this particular transaction. Okay, uh, so this is also a valid transaction. So that's fine. Um, but the problem is that uh, this transaction is only valid if this transaction goes first. Okay, so the fact that this transaction is is valid is conditional on this transaction being put in a block. Okay, and similarly, this can't be put in a block unless if these other two are put in a block. Okay, so sometimes you have transactions that are, are sort of chained together like this, and they either um, they have to go in order. Okay, and the um, and you can put them all in the same block. So so this this and this can all go in the same block. Okay, so what will happen is uh, you'll put these initially in your UTXO pool, but then you'll take them out right away. Then you'll put this in the UTXO pool, and then we'll, you'll take it out right away. Okay, so within the same block, uh, you may be putting new things in and, and taking them out of your UTXO pool. Okay, so that's that's the first nuance for for how you update uh, your UTXO pool. So we'll call this uh, transaction chains. And then that's also going to be a factor when you're deciding which transactions are you putting in your block. Like, say this pays a really high fee. Right? So you might want to put it in your block, uh, but your block is full and these maybe pay low fees, right? Well, you don't have a choice, right? If you put this in, then you have to put these other two in as well, okay? So in a sense, what you might do is you might consider this as one big transaction, add up all three of the fees across it, and also uh, think about the size of it, okay? Now, you can put part of the chain in, but you just have to start from the start. So you could put these two transactions in and drop the third, that's fine. Or you could put the first in and drop the second and the third. But you can't put the second and third in and drop the first, or put the third in without and drop the first and the second. Um, so, so anyways, these, these chains are, are um, one of the nuances uh, for thinking about how you update your UTXO pools. Um, so let's describe this as update your UTXO pool. Uh, 
Um, and then the second thing uh, is uh, the Coinbase transaction. This is a, a transaction that has an output but no input, okay? So what that means is you don't do anything here for the Coinbase, but you do do something here, okay? You are actually going to add that uh, to the transaction, okay? Now, the final thing that you're going to do is, uh, of course, all the transactions that were uh, included in the block that you had in your mempool because they were pending transactions for you, you have to remove them from the mempool as well, okay? So you're going to remove all uh, transactions from mempool. Okay, and there's some nuances here, and this gets really, really specific. So I'm just, I'll say it in words. I won't, I won't put it in the nodes itself. But um, what might happen is that, uh, so for example, think of this transaction. This transaction spends this transaction, but there might be another transaction that's floating around the network that spends this transaction as well. So it's a different transaction. And uh, this is, we call this a double spend. Uh, not because you, you manage to double spend uh, the Bitcoin necessarily, um, but what, what can happen is uh, if nodes look at uh, whether something's just in somebody's mempool, if, if you put up, like say you're a coffee shop and you're going to take Bitcoin, uh, you might say, as soon as I see that transaction in my mempool, I know eventually it's going to end up in the blockchain, so I'll just give you your coffee uh, in response. Um, so that's fine, you can do that. Uh, the, the issue is that there might be other transactions that are in di other people's mempools, because everyone has a slightly different uh, mempool, uh, that spend that same Bitcoin in a different way, that doesn't send that Bitcoin to a coffee shop. Okay, so we mentioned that uh, previously that, that you, you might want to wait uh, until this is actually put in the blockchain uh, and, and kind of deep, deeply integrated in the blockchain before you actually believe that it happened. Um, but anyways, let's say that different mempools have uh, different transactions, then let's say that this one actually gets put in the block, then you may have something in your mempool that can't be put in the blockchain because it competes with this particular transaction, then you're also going to have to drop those transactions from your mempool. So you're removing all the transactions uh, that are in the block from your mempool, plus for, for re weird corner case reasons, there might be some other transactions that, that you have to remove as well. Okay. So all transactions in block, in the new block uh, from, from your mempool, okay? So you're gonna update your UTXO pool and your, your mempool. Okay, and then you just start again, okay? So you start collecting transactions, you build up your mempool, you try and, you know, the miners are trying to put them in blocks and, and this whole process repeats itself, uh, you know, every 10 minutes on average, a new block is created.